37th parallel on America's haunted highway, it's Pixelated Paranormal, your guide to the unusual and the strange. Welcome back to Pixelated Paranormal, episode 16. That was 15. With me tonight are my normal co-hosts, Preston and Rob. Boys, how are you? Good, good, good. Yeah, I've been better. Good. Short, sweet, <laughs> and to the point. <laughs> well, I want to take a second and uh, just say congratulations on the fundraiser for Extra Life. You guys raised a pretty pretty good chunk of money for your first shot, man. That was really great. How much money did you guys bring in? Uh, $575. Nice. Nice. Um, if you guys still want to donate, you can find that information on my web or my Facebook page. Um, you can still take donations up to the end of the year. So if you want to turn that 575 into $10,000, you know, I'm all up for that. <laughs> nice. We're not... We can set unexpected goals here, but uh, yeah, I I didn't do the whole 24 hours in one go. I ended up getting very sick. Uh, diabetes takes a toll on your body, especially when you try to stay up for 24 hours straight. So about 19 and a half hours I had to cut out and get a little bit of rest, and then I came back and finished up the other five and a half hours later. So uh, yeah. I need to put all that up on YouTube, too. I need to export that to my YouTube channel so people can watch me slowly go mad. <laughs> And the weird baby Steven debacle. <laughs> yes, the whole baby Steven. Oh, that was funny. Well, dude, like, uh, I mean, 19 hours straight is no small feat in itself. So, I mean, for your first shot, 19 straight hours is pretty impressive. So, I am, yeah, I am very proud of you. I can't complain. I did pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. And it was cool because I remember in the beginning, you were just like, yeah, I mean, I hope we can raise 100 bucks between the three of us. I didn't expect to get that much, honestly. So, I was pretty impressed that we were able to to get going so yeah that was pretty awesome well and i know steve <laughs> was saying yeah just, i hope i get a donation outside of the money i put in and yeah you guys all did fantastic i'm i'm very proud of you it's it's a pretty awesome little fundraiser and i mean honestly like you're raising money right. doing what you like to do so uh, that, that's a pretty awesome deal. And we had a lot of people participate. We had a lot of donations. So big thanks to everybody who donated and everybody who participated. It was a very, <laughs> very fun night of uh, gaming and shenanigans. Right. So, and uh, next year we're going to hit it bigger and harder. I'm going to set up a page and I know a lot of other people will too. Um, and see if we can all just, uh, knock out that 24 hours. Yeah. I'm really, I've been told by a couple of friends of mine that they think they can get some, uh, some stuff for us, and uh, I can also um, uh, get some artwork and stuff from my buddy. So yeah, we'll be able to knock it out harder next year. So yeah, I'm I'm calling it now. We will raise a thousand dollars. I I will see. I'm gonna go one dollar. I'm gonna go eight fifty. You guys all overbid, then I win. Eight fifty. Okay. Well, boys, what do you say we just jump straight into the news? <laughs> Let's talk for a second about what has been going on in Gardner's Celebration Park in the Kansas City area. Are you boys ready? Sitting down. Rob, are you, are you holding on to your seats? I, I'm. The seats are being held on to, yes. Why are you sitting in more than one seat? Yeah. Well, you know, things happen. <laughs> <laughs> It is unclear exactly what has been going on at night in Gardner Celebration Park, but trail cameras posted there are capturing more than just photos of skunks, raccoons, and other various creatures. The Gardner police on Monday released a series of strange images recorded by cameras posted around the 83-acre park to record wildlife. The photos show what appears to be people in costumes as monsters other and other characters engaging in unexplained activities at night. Among them are Santa Claus, the abominable snowman, and a pair of gorillas uh, getting down into risky business. The images released were recorded from several nights from November 21st through the 28th. And police uh, said that some of the acts involved were very lewd and preposterous and gave them a good laugh. <laughs> 
So Santa Claus, the Abominable Snowman, and uh, ooh, if you scroll through the images at the very end, there is one of an old lady in a walker. Um, nice. We're uh, having fun in the park. I just uh, thought that that was hilarious, and uh, the uh, my lady found it and thought I should read it. So boom, <laughs> new story taken care of. <laughs> Fair enough. You Fair got anything enough. else? Well, I do. Now, going on to something that's actual paranormal, we're going to talk for a minute about a the uh, Victor. Villa Children's Hospital in central Argentina's uh, city of Rosario. We're going to talk about a story about a reported haunted balloon floating down the highways. Now, a local artist with an interest in the paranormal was shown the video named Dante Triparale. He said that there is an entity there, a soul, something, but I don't know what. From my point of view, we should be very happy in these situations. I think it was a soul, something that was wandering around. There are open gates that we cannot perceive. These things give us hope. They shouldn't scare us. Now, the video shows a balloon wandering the hallways, floating by itself, up, down, moving from left to right. And in one instance, we see a man and a woman um, both talking to each other. The male says, it's coming toward us, exclamation point. Why the female colleague responds, the girl on the bed said they touched her. Oh no, it's coming toward us. Most people who saw the balloon reported that it did not move like a normal balloon filled with helium or air, that it most definitely was possessed by a small ghost-like child. Okay. Hmm. What do you guys think? I mean, was there's no video of this or anything? Um, I did find a video, not on YouTube, but if you go to the mirror.uk um, and look it up, uh, they actually have a video on the actual news article itself where you can kind of watch it move up and down and kind of, in one instance, it gets to the end of the hall and physically turns, so it makes like a right angle turn and then goes the other direction and through a doorway. Um, so it wasn't just where it was like, you know, floating in the wind or anything. Like this was actually kind of like a steady movement. And then it was actually making turns left and right as it was moving around the hospital room. Huh. Well, that's kind of neat. Yeah. You know, what gets me is like the, the artist being involved. Like, why do they go to an artist? Like, why didn't they just go to any other Joe Blow? Like, how come this guy's getting in, you know, his name in the newspaper? Um, I don't know. It doesn't say, but I would assume just because he's a, uh, you know, like has like a, uh, carries a little bit of respect, you know, <laughs> respect with him. So he's like an, a respected opinion in the community. Uh-huh. Hmm. It sounds to me like maybe he's behind the whole, uh, fiasco. <sighs> hmm. I'm just saying, you know, we can't, uh, we can't you get just, excited about you every just debunked my hopes. haunted picture of us. He killed it. I just, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to get too excited over some guy's little you, uh, social experiment. <laughs> so you took my hopes and you debunked them. Well, I'd rather you be debunked than fly high on false hopes. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, though. I mean, like, maybe this guy made this video knowing the city would come to him and be like, hey, what do you think? Oh, to me, it appears <laughs> to be a spirit of a child. And I bet if we wait long enough, he may make more videos if the general public he enjoys this one. But what, about the, what about the little girl <laughs> in the hospital bed saying, oh, my God, that touched me? Well, I don't know. I'm not saying 100%. <laughs> she could have a case of the space crazies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, there could be something to it. I'm just, uh, I'm not going to put all my all my eggs in that basket. I don't think. Or maybe the Santa Claus on the trail cam. He's involved somehow. Maybe, maybe. But uh, speaking of artists, I've got a pretty uh, interesting story here. Um, it's from HuffPo under their weird news tab, and it's titled "A Woman Sent Her Amputated Toe to a Stranger on Tumblr." Now, just like every other thing that HuffPost starts off with, it's obviously clickbait because I don't. Uh, I, the story is a little more a little more in, uh, innocent than this title goes on to say. So, let me uh, forgive me for reading most of this, but it, I'm not going to do it justice unless I do. So, it says here, "If feet gross you out, leave now. Are you still here? Great. Let's talk about gross. I'm leaving. Toe jam. <laughs> Bye, Rob. <laughs> Toe jam and Earl." Now let's talk about this Tumblr user who sent another Tumblr user her pinky toe. Yes, her actual toe. Uh, According to the toe's owner, Haley, the toe was amputated years ago. I had brachymetatarsia, a condition where one of your toes or metatarsal bones stops growing, she said. As I got older, the skin around my toe began to get infections and tear open. Gross, I know. 
and it would cause me to not be able to even walk at times. I was constantly in pain. At the age of 17, a doctor said he'd help me the best he could by removing the problem, by removing the toe. He took away my fourth toe. The recipient, Lana, has sent the disembodied toe to preserve it properly for Haley. The preservation fluid currently housing the toe expired in 2011 and began to get cloudy, and Lana plans to get it changed. (laughs) Now, here's some comments from Tumblr. From Tumblr member Cummy Eyelids. (laughs) Did she just say Cummy Eyelids? Oh, okay, so this must be the artist. A few days ago, I received a very special package. Ravioli? In the mail. It contained this amputated toe, a human toe, belonging to the lovely... Royal Laoli, or whatever this girl's name is. Literally, this is a toe off her foot. I'll be changing the solution, putting it in a new prettier jar, and potentially making it into a wearable pendant. Taking on this project is so super meaningful to me, more so than any other jewelry project project I've ever taken on. I'm so appreciative of her trust in me, and I'm also excited to get to work on this. Now, Royally Oily... Okay, that makes more sense now that I say it out loud. Royally Oily replies back, literally brought tears to my eyes. I'm so grateful and excited myself. Not only do I ops, not only do I absolutely trust your artistic expertise, cummy eyelids, but I also feel my body part, yes, an actual piece of me, could not be in more capable hands. I know you will respect and care for my little piggy. I appreciate this more than you'll ever really know. You probably have a lot of questions about this, the article says. For example, why is the toe still hanging around? Why would someone want anybody else's random toe? Haley told us that she kept her toe because of spiritual reasons. I feel very inclined to be buried or cremated whole with all my teeth and bones, she said. I decided to have Lana rejar my toe because the liquid has been long overdue for a change. But also, I really love my toe. It's a part of me and deserves a proper enclosure. We, too, love our toes, Haley, says HuffPo. Um, <laughs> um, somebody comments on this Tumblr feed. I'm not here to judge, but what are you going to do with the toe? Cummy Eyelids replies, put it in a new pretty jar with new preservation solution and make it into a pendant, probably. I, I worry about America. Lana said on Tumblr that in addition to changing the preservation solution, she'll be electroforming the lid shut and adding crystals or stones to make it extra sparkly and pretty. <laughs> so she's making a snow globe out of a toe, a toe globe. She's going to bedazzle it. I mean, people thought the worst thing was making Trump president. No, it's letting people put toes in snow globes. <laughs> That's true. When will the insanity stop? We're not too sure where one would don a bejeweled disembodied toe, but to each their own. Let people live, right? Quotage saying, I needed a... Sean, if you ever die before me, can you, like, have somebody, like, bottle or jar your hobbit foot for me so that I can keep it with me always? I might. I might do that. Royally Oily says, I needed a way to honor the life of my toe. It was with me for 17 years. It simply deserves a little more respect than a plastic jar that it's been in since 2008. What? Supporters of the Toe Exchange have been saying they wish that they still had their removed ribs to send to Lana now, to have them reworked as well. The Another suggested sending a part of their amputated vagina <laughs> to be turned into art. <laughs> uh, yes. Moist. Yep. Lana says, I've contacted various wet specimen artists over the years, and not a single one would take on this project. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful that Lana is so open minded Okay, sorry. Oh Royally Oily said, I've contacted various wet specimen artists over the years. Not a single one would take on this project. I'm so grateful that Lana is so open minded and also so talented. I'm lucky the internet connected us. Tumblr is a magical wonderland, <laughs> folks, of blogging and body parts. Yeah, there you go. That's my news. Rob, follow that up. Well, uh, I wish I could. So I could forget it. Um, so I've come across a story from Mysterious Universe called Mysterious Mummified Monk May Be Moving. So uh, there's a monk uh, that is uh, kept in a uh, museum in uh, Siberia. And uh, they captured some CCTV footage of uh, of the museum. And it shows what looks to be someone moving around the museum. Um, now they don't have the video here. They just have a couple of grainy pictures. Um, but some, a couple of astute, uh, 
watchers of the video or whatever bring up the fact that uh, it looks to be a man in camouflage. And also, uh, apparently, this museum is guarded by soldiers in military uniforms. So how they think this is a museum monk uh, that's been walking around at night, I have no idea. But apparently, looking at this one picture, it does exactly look like a soldier in camouflage carrying what looks to be two bags. Like he's carrying his groceries. A little odd in the museum, but definitely less odd than a monk getting up and walking around the the museum by himself. <laughs> um, now, this yeah. is one of those mummies that they think that uh, got uh, meditated and in the lotus position and just never got up again. Oh, okay, so, sure, yeah. Um, and he's they he he left a message to say that he wished to uh, be buried. But then he would wanted to be dug up like, I can't remember how many years later it was, like 20 years later. And he does look quite preserved for something that was not mummified uh, and just buried in the ground. It, it, the pictures obviously looked like to me like a soldier. But it's still, you know, um, the, the whole idea that this mummy, this, this mummy, this monk wanted to um, be uh, actually unearthed later to just to see for whatever purposes he had. In his afterlife or, or whatever, so right. But so, what if what if it really is a monk and he's just been meditating this entire time? Well, I mean, he doesn't look like he has a face anymore. I mean, Ooh. it's not like he, you know, it isn't like he's like, hey, Uncle Bob just died yesterday and we got him in a coffin and we can go see him at the viewing. <laughs> I mean, it looks like he's, yeah, it's it's not it's not a pleasant picture. I mean. Uh, what most people don't know is there's like a process <clears throat> to this form of uh, what, what is an actual mummification process, and the the Japanese um, Buddhists took it to the extreme, where they would ingest certain chemicals like formaldehyde and like other things that we use in embalming, and then they would drink those chemicals and then meditate um, and keep their their vitals at a very like. You know, like a low heartbeat and things like that. Where those chemicals um, took took the process over, and that's how they actually self mummify themselves by like ingesting these chemicals. Now, the actual Tibetan monks, instead of using like formaldehyde and things like that, they would actually um, drink this special tea from a root that would kill off the bacteria in their body. And then they would go through this ritualistic process of eating like pine needles for X amount of days. Um, and then they would slowly dry um, their body out by eating certain foods. Mm-hmm. Um, and the ritual took like five years to complete. And then once it was done, you reached the uh, the state of enlightenment or you were considered to re- uh, reach the state of enlightenment. Mm-hmm. So he's fucking dead. So he went through this process and died a very horrible, painful death um, to reach enlightenment. No, he's walking around the museum. Did you not hear the story I just told Preston? <laughs> well, they're fucking liars, okay? Because n- nobody nobody gets back up from well, that, Rob. Maybe this monk did. Maybe that's his. Maybe that's what he does. That's what he does. He ain't no Buddha. Um. Uh, and so I came across this story earlier today, also. I was looking for things to talk about, and I thought this is a uh, a very interesting story. I found this on the Weekend Weird. Um, Father Urbane Grandier and Satan's signature see an actual contract signed by the devil himself. So Father Urbane Grandier uh, was probably one of the worst priests of all time. Number one, the man just could not keep with the vow of celibacy. Uh, he was a very handsome person. <laughs> and he had a reputation for enticing many of the uh, powerful women of the local uh, area uh, into bed. Uh, this happened in the 1600s, 1630, uh, in a town of Loundon, France. Um, he, so he was always sleeping with women. Uh, and uh, However, it did get him into a little bit of trouble. He, uh, he, got, uh, he got arrested for immorality. Uh, was thrown in jail, but he only, but he was thrown in jail for mm-hmm. supposed to be several years. However, within a year he got out, uh, and even had his clerical duties restored. So his pool in the, the area of power in her, there had actually gotten him out of jail. Probably some of the women he slept with were friends of some friends and, you know, and got him out of jail. Uh, and got, he even got his, you know, like I said, he even got his ability to be a priest back. So, um, 
he went hmm. he went back to to leading a church and everything. Uh, well, he he made an enemy of a Father Mignon. Now, this man's going to become very important to the story um, because apparently the man got jealous because he was tired of seeing this dude getting laid all the time. He's like, "Well, I'm I took a vow of celibacy, and he's fucking all these women." So, um, they basically started spreading rumors that he was, uh, having, uh, having, uh, talks with the devil and stuff like that. Uh, and even started convincing some of the nuns that he was having, uh, that they were having fits of madness. So these nuns were going around acting like, uh, like you see in the movies and stuff of, of uh, barking like dogs walking around on all fours, screaming and howling at all hours of the night. Um, eventually, uh, they would, uh, they started trying to figure out what was, what was going on. And they basically claimed that, uh, that they were all, that all this stuff started, uh, after they talked to Father Grandier. Um, and there was one woman in particular, Sister Jean de Angers. Uh, swore that, that she didn't have any of this effects to happen until after, um, she had spoken to, to Father G- uh, Grandier. Uh, and then in March of 1633, so this is three years after he went to jail, uh, and got back out again, uh, they claimed that he had hellish powers, uh, and they began to form, perform exorcisms on the nuns and stuff at this, at this church that he, he was living at. Um, and eventually they, they started gathering large crowds at these, uh, um, exorcisms. As many as 7,000 people were coming to watch these women howl and, and yelp and, and, and cry out that they were, uh, being, uh, molested by Satan and such. Uh, and it even got so bad that Father, the, the priest tried to actually go down there and do the exorcisms himself, which just made things worse because they didn't act in, Ten times worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so he was. They were just so confused. Well, there still was no proof that uh, he had done any of this stuff. That he was uh, a member of Satan's cabinet or whatever. Uh, but, however, some stunning piece of evidence came forward. Uh, a contract was said to have been stolen from Lucifer's, Lucifer's very cabinet of Pax by the demon Asmodeus showed a written agreement scribbled in backwards Latin between Grandier, a handful of demons, and the devil himself. The contract even included unique signatures for all mentioned parties. We, the influential Lucifer, the young Satan, not the old Satan, the young Satan, I didn't, I didn't, uh, Beelzebub, Leviathan, Elami, uh, Astaroth, together with others have told, today accepted the covenant pact of Urbane Grandier, who is ours, the contract read, and him do we promise the love of women, the flowers of virgins, and the respect of monarchs, honors, lusts, and powers. So, reading over this contract, it seems kind of fitting that these are all the things that he had been accused of in the past. Love of women, deflowering virgins, uh, he had all the respect of people with power, uh, and then suddenly this, this ta-da! This uh, this devil's pact comes up. Um, now, this day and age, this would get laughed out, of course. Uh, however, this is all the proof they needed. The man was sentenced and burned at the stake because of this. Um, then, uh, after after many years, this th- this you know this contract became lost or whatever. Not really lost, but it came back. Uh, somebody found it years later and looked it over. And the proof, here's the, here's the proof, it was actually matched the handwriting of the sister Jean, uh, de Angel- Des An- Angeles, Angies. So she pretty much just wrote a contract, a fake contract up and basically had this man burned at the stake because her and the other guy couldn't stand him. So, <laughs> so, you know, next time that somebody, uh, you fuck with somebody. Just remember, if if Christianity ever takes the total control, you guys are all fucked. Cause somebody's gonna write some goddamn demon 
contract with you, and you're gonna be you're gonna be burned at the stake. So all you gotta do is get some old parchment paper and know about thirteen or fourteen different <laughs> yeah, but high they do level have the, uh, demon names, and you're good to go. And then be able to write Latin backwards. Yeah, learn how to write Latin backwards. Which, I mean, how hard can it be if you can write it forwards, right? Just use a mirror. Right. So yeah, yeah you know, Padre right, nominee, nominee, nominee. <laughs> so yeah, so that's that's happened. So yes, they burned that man at the stake. He was supposed to be hung, but the people were so angry and upset that they drug him out early. And had him burned at the stake. <laughs> right before she could get running down the stairs and be like, oh, it's just a joke. <laughs> it's just a joke. Instead, she's sitting in her bedroom shaking. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. And I can just That's see this fantastic. other priest going, ha now the pussy's all mine. <laughs> oh, that's true. Man, that's so shitty. That, that reminds me of the old uh, Salem Witch yeah, Trials, it really, man. it really does. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. That's what's sad is the whole mass hysteria idea. And especially back in those days, you didn't have the internet or a lot of ways to communicate and hatch a scheme. So you just did that and nobody, I mean, people well, were none here, the wiser. Here's the thing. Um, I have a friend. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk, give any details about her. Um, her name's not Beelzebub, is it? No. Uh, she, she was okay. part, her parents were part of a cult, uh, where she lived in Japan. And maybe I'm giving way mm-hmm. too much information, but uh, it was it was called the Church of God cult, and it was a, basically a, a religious organization who did a lot of nefarious things. Think of think of what the norm the Mormons that you hear the stuff about the Mormons, and think about this as being like ten times worse. I mean, they were doing all kinds of weird, mm-hmm. freaky sex crap and all that, sex magic and stuff like that. Um, but eventually, the whole reason why that church fell apart. Is because of places, things like the internet. The word started getting out. They were, you know, all sheltered, living in like one area, and then the internet came about, and people were able to get more information about what was going on in the outside world. And they're like, "What the hell are we doing? Why? Why are we living like this? This is all a joke." And she claims that a lot of it, the reasons why her sisters and stuff left was because of this, because they were able to actually to get really? out and see that the world was not like they had been taught living in a sheltered existence. So, well, there's a lot of belief systems and religions like that to where you stay in for so long and then at a certain point you're allowed to step out for a short period of time to see if you like the way the real world is and rum springer. I don't know what that means, but it sounds like a delicious beverage. That's the uh that is the what the um Oh shit, the Amish do. They're allowed to get out Have and, a rum uh, springer break. Do their thing for like a, a week or something and then they have to come back and and join up with the old ways, but they get to go out and try technology mm-hmm. and stuff. You know Robert the Now can they Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was gonna I was gonna tell a story about another guy that supposedly sold his soul to the devil to to get something, but that'll wait. I wanna hear what you had to say. Oh, I was just gonna tell a story about how a uh, man sold his soul to get something, so I guess I'll go. Um so when when an Amish person leaves the uh, I don't I I'm ignorant to this, the village per se, can they stay away? I mean, do they have to come back or can they just stay away permanently? No, they can stay away from Okay, cool. I just want to make sure that TLC didn't lie to me on uh, Breaking Amish because I was about to be heartbroken. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe that that great channel would lie to me about anything, so I don't want to sully my uh, opinion of them now. So, Okay, Preston, go ahead. So do you all know who... You were going to go anyway. Who Robert uh, Johnson is? I don't want to interrupt you. Who what? Robert Johnson. Harry Johnson? Oh, okay. No, never met the guy. So oh, Robert uh, Johnson was one of the... Uh, basically like the forefathers to rock and roll. So if it weren't for his early blues music, um, a lot of uh, like Led Zeppelin and uh, Pink Floyd, um, that they, they, they took a lot of their guitar riffs and certain things from Robert Johnson. He was a really heavy influence. Anyways, he, he was a, a just a poor black man in the early 1900s. And uh, one day he came across the, uh, a crossroads at a railroad track and uh, the, the devil appeared to him and said that uh, he would offer him anything in the whole entire world for his soul. And Robert Johnson said, I want to learn how to play guitar. And so the, the 
the devil said deal. And uh, the, the legend goes that uh, the devil showed him how to play guitar. And if you ever read up on Robert Johnson, he's the only person who would actually use all five fingers um, on the neck of the guitar. So he would actually bend his thumb over and use that uh, the thumb on the threats. And uh, he just has this really distinct sound. And uh, toward the end of his life, he was at a, a bar one night playing, and uh, he kept uh, grabbing the uh, barkeep's uh, wife's ass as she was bringing the beer by. And so, you know, with all five fingers, huh? With all five fingers, with all five fingers. And uh, so, you know, being in the early 20s, uh, the barkeep was like, I ain't having no black guy touch my wife's ass like that. So he uh, put rat poison in Robert Johnson's beer. And then about halfway through the concert, Robert Johnson fell over dead and was like, you know, vomiting up nasty stuff. And people say that was the devil um, coming to claim his soul. And it was such an influential tale that, oh, brother, where art thou with uh, uh, George Clooney? George Clooney. The black guy in that, uh, that, uh, that, that movie sold his soul to the devil as well. That was them, uh, you, you know, poking fun at that legend with Robert Johnson. Huh. Well, I'll be damned. Yeah, there you go. Well, did you ever hear, did you ever hear about um, supposedly – uh, what was his name? Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin actually had a pact with the devil as well. Oh yeah, he had a pact with. And I'm not going to talk Z- about on this episode. Be- What's that? Zozo. Uh, man, I don't remember. I didn't. I'm not going to get into it because uh, I just listened to Bizarre States and they talked about it. And then uh, Jessica Chobot had a pretty nice little uh, spot about it. Uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. You ought to definitely check out that episode. Or uh, just look it up on your own, but it's some pretty uh, convincing stuff, I suppose. Plus, back then that was it is. You know what? Um, yeah, as I scroll through here real quick, it does talk about uh, Zoso. Hmm. Something about Zoso. So yeah, interesting stuff. But yeah, I mean, what was that back in the late seventies, early eighties? I don't know my Zeppelin. That <laughs> Zeppelin well. would have been like sixty eight, sixty nine, up until eighty. 182, so it probably would have been early 70s. Um, Led Zeppelin 4 was the album that had all the Zozo stuff on it. And, uh, yeah, um, yeah. So that would have been 73, 74. Well, I think um, at this point, we ought to go ahead and hear a little bit from our man on the street, uh, Stephen. Recently, Big Steven just uh, took a pretty awesome vacation down to Roswell and got to see the sites and some of the museums and the crash site and all that. So uh, that's that's really awesome. We're pretty pretty happy for him to take that vacation. So um, and while he was down there, he sent us in um, some food for thought, I guess you'd say. So we're gonna play that real quick and uh, let you guys hear what he had to say. From our man on the front lines riding the haunted highways of America, it's a paranormal update from Big Steven. What's going on, guys? This is Big Steven calling from the haunted highway. <laughs> Anyways, uh, as your man on the ground, you know, I have to keep you guys updated on the, on the scary and spooky and the extraterrestrial findings. Anyways, this, uh, week I went on a road trip which I'm actually on the road coming back from Roswell New Mexico now uh, been wanting to go there for a long time and um, yeah so I said fuck it let's go and went and it was a great time went to the International UFO Museum it was really cool um, basically just details the Roswell crash landing the timeline of events if you will and they have all kinds of like art and deco and stuff like that. It was really cool. Sadly, driving into Mexico at night, didn't see any UFO sightings, which, which I love hearing, um, you know, listener stories and stories you guys talk about on the show. And sadly, I didn't see any. Didn't see any Bigfoot sightings either, which would be pretty badass. But then again, I'm not really in that much uh, wooded areas. Out here, it's mostly desert. But you never know. Maybe he's, you, uh, Bigfoot wanted to get a suntan. <laughs> But I also went to Carlsbad Caverns, which is uh, an amazing, amazing experience if you guys have never been there. It's one of the national parks, and um, you know you go down underneath the earth, and you're in just these caves and these tunnels, man. And it makes me wonder if, like, you know, if you guys have ever seen the movie The Descent, you know, these beings that have been down there, and, uh, you know, 
they've been in these caves for so long their bodies have adapted because a lot of like insects and uh, animals and you know whatever you want down there whatever you want to call them other living creatures they've adapted over time you know they become blind or uh, almost like albino where you can see their innards through their skin it's pretty sweet so I don't know discuss that guys like what do you do you think that some of these caves and caverns in the in the United States or the world that there might be you know like some kind of beings or creatures that we've never discovered because we we haven't explored all them caves and there's so many deep dark caverns that you know people will never explore because either it's too deep or it's too dangerous you know do you think there's things down there what do you think and yes if you get a chance come to Roswell it's a great it's a great little town it's quirky they got a lot of cool um, cool places to shop and, and uh, I mean come on it's aliens and uh, aliens are amazing so alright thanks for listening guys and as always I love you guys this podcast and please uh, continue it and doing great things alright you're a man on the ground Nick Steven out so basically, uh, Steve, what you're what you're asking about um, subterranean creatures and life and what we think could be underground, um, that kind of ties in nicely with uh, this book I just picked up. I mentioned it last time on our last episode called Paranormal Mysteries of Eurasia, written by Paul Stonehill. So thanks for that sweet little segue. Um, so I guess we can kind of answer some of your questions about uh, what we think might be underground um, in the world. So do you guys have anything you want to go into first? Uh, I mean, we always hear the rumors about like Dulce, New Mexico and the reptilians. Uh, war that happened out there, uh, between us and, and the reptilians. I, whether it happened or not, you know, that's always up for debate. But, uh, you always hear the stories about the reptilians. They're one of the biggest groups of aliens that we hear about on Earth, and a lot of them are supposed to be living underground and, and such. So, I mean, I'm, I mean, and there's the Admiral Bird stuff in the North Pole. Uh, I mean, there's no telling what's down there. There's lots of caves and, there's so many caves that we can't even explore all of them because of dangerous situations. So there's no telling what's underneath the earth that we don't know about. There was a, uh, a story I've heard a while back. I think, uh, I may have mentioned this on the show before, but my buddy, uh, Tony back when we were in high school told me this story and there's a guy and he's spelunking and I don't remember where, I think somewhere over in like England or something. And while he's down there, of course, he's got his flashlight and his lanterns and stuff. And it's the old song and dance of how, you know, the, the battery's failing on the flashlights and the lanterns and all that. And he's running out of matches and he happens to shine his flashlight and see what looks like a, a pixie up on this, uh, stone shelf in this cave. And it kind of spooks him. And then he shines his flashlight over uh, another direction and sees some other kind of like little, uh, troll or goblin or something kind of hunkered down behind a, a rock formation and then he turns around and shines his flashlight again on another spot. And there's this thing that looks kind of like, uh, I guess you'd say Smeagol. And it just scared the living shit out of him. And he just kicked rocks, got out of there, as qu- <laughs> pun intended, and got out of the cave as quick as he could. And he's telling everybody like, oh, my God, you got to see this place. You got to see this place. And it, what it ended up being was, I think, the start of a uh, amusement park or themed uh, cave tour. And it was defunded. And they basically just stopped where they were at with the uh, construction. And I guess they were going to set up like animatronic uh, puppets of all these, you know, subterranean mythical creatures. And so they just left him in there. This poor guy stumbled in and thought he'd found like Narnia or something. But uh, I've tried and tried and tried to find that story. I've never been able to find it. But I'd, I'd like to find the the guy's, uh, you know, his personal account of what the hell happened. So, Well, let's talk about the Mount Shasta. So Mount Shasta is a majestic mountain, part of the Cascade Mountain Range. Uh, located in Siskiyou County in North California, which is 45 miles from the Oregon border. Now, there are tons and tons and tons of tales about Mount Shasta. Um, a lot of them come from people who are supposedly like clairvoyant, and they'll be walking around the mountain, and all of a sudden they see St. Germain. Now, St. Germain is this enigmatic character who was like counsel to uh, 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 Charlemagne and different people like that um, and supposedly this guy is like six seven eight hundred uh, uh, years old like he's just this this enigmatic person who's got all these special powers 
And supposedly he resides on Mount Shasta now. And uh, Mount Shasta is supposed to be home of the Lumerians, Mm -hmm. which uh, the Lumerians are part of this mythical continent called Mu. And uh interesting fact about that is uh, the uh, Hindus have a legend about a continent that was in between India and Africa, this like this piece of land. And 50,000, 45,000 years ago, um, it sank uh, beneath the waves. There was like a giant earthquake. And in modern day, scientists uh, propose that there was this land bridge in between those two continents so that they could explain the, the migration of lemurs from Madagascar to India or Madagascar to Africa. There are little certain spots where these little lemurs pop up. And for them to be able to explain it, there'd be this little land bridge. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting that modern day science kind of claimed that there had to be something there. And then it shows up in ancient Hindu text. Um, now, the the crazies say that it was actually 12,000 years ago that Atlantis, a.k.a. Lumeria, sank. And that all these uh, beings uh, showed up inside the mountain and they live inside the mountain now. And you have tales of people who live in and around a mountain that say that the, these Lumerians will come in the town They'll go up to the grocery stores or wherever, and they'll be buying, like, you know, meats, you know, butter, flour, like, just weird things here and there. And they just, like, drop a pile of gold on the counter and be like, see you later. And then the people are like, wait a minute. They only bought, like, $50 of groceries, but they left me, like, $600 worth of gold. Like, what the hell's going on? Uh Uh-huh. Now, uh, some other people who are clairvoyant say that uh, the if you tap into your psychic abilities that uh, there is a giant etheric purple pyramid whose capstone reaches far beyond the planet into space and connects us intergalactically to the confederation of planets for the Milky Way galaxy. There you go. Lumeria is, or uh, Mount Shasta is home to the Lumerians and a fucking giant purple pyramid that reaches into outer space. And is a homie beacon to reptilians and other odd things. Oh. oh the old reptilians again, hmm. eh? And also Mount huh. Shasta is reports of like airships. So like when we have all those weird like steampunk airship uh, sightings from like the mid 1800s, early 1900s, like Mount Shasta is like the number one spot for all those sightings. Hmm. Huh. And there's a lot of information. So we like one of these days when I get motivated, I'll like do all the research and do a nice big topic on Mount Shasta, Lumerians and, you know, disappearing Bigfoots that are in the area too. Yeah, I'd like to pick up a couple books sometime about Mount Shasta because it's almost as uh, interesting as uh, Skinwalker Ranch, I think, which we didn't really do Skinwalker Ranch that much justice. I don't feel like we ought to, uh, we ought to jump back in that sometime and discuss more of that. And also, so. if you're searching the web for Lumerian crystals, you're going to look for quartz crystals that have brown striations up and down the shaft of the crystal. And if you rub your fingers <laughs> up and down the shafts of those of the striations, those brown striations, that supposedly is where the Lumerians or the Atlantans um, hid secret knowledge that you can pick up on psychic. You need to stop going to psychic fairs. <laughs> you know, I, this is what I got to do for this show is I learn about all this crazy shit so that you all, you know, you, you all know about it. <laughs> I'm glad somebody did. <laughs> I'm glad you sacrificed your brain and your well-being. So do you, your... do you all want me to buy a Lumerian crystal online and have it shipped to the house, and then I'll sit there and rub the striations to see if I come up with anything? Because I will do it for you guys. I will take one for the team. No, because I'd, I'd hate to walk over to your house and walk in your front door and see you rubbing your striations. Stroking a crystal? <laughs> Getting your Reiki everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll touch you with my Reiki. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, back to uh, back to what I was saying a minute ago about uh, underground and, and everything else. Uh, this Paranormal Mysteries of Eurasia by Paul Stonehill. Uh, basically, I'm about halfway through the book, and so far, it's been a little bit um, boring to read. But uh, anyway, so it's got a little bit of information about a place called Hilava which is in the Czech Republic. Hilava is the oldest mining town in the Czech Republic, where, according to many legends, um, there used to be a lot of silver mines. And I think they said that they were worked as early as, like, the 799 A.D. Mm. 
And this town of Hilava used to be located on the uh, the really important trade routes and trade routes and um, the silver mining in- industry, I guess you'd say, the boom back then. And uh, since then, it's become a pretty big uh, center for regional businesses and whatnot, but that's kind of boring. What's not boring, though, is underneath the little town of Hilava, Hilava there are a long series of catacombs. And these catacombs, they say, are the second longest uh, series of tunnels in the Czech Republic. And they measure right around 15 and a half miles long, covering an area of something to the tune of like 164,000 square feet, which is pretty freaking big. And they say that part of the reason why these catacombs are so large is because they're actually a series of tunnels being connected to a bunch of uh, cellars from all these old Gothic style buildings. So um, what's interesting about these catacombs is that they're not just like one single story of catacombs. A lot of them are actually formed of many different floors. So they say the first floor of these catacombs can be usually about six to 13 feet deep underground. The second floor is usually about 13 to 19 feet below ground. And then sometimes you can find third levels, which are actually about 20, 26 to 45 feet underground. So we're, we're pretty damn deep underground at this point if you're exploring these catacombs. And the catacombs were built with some mystery behind them. Some historians think that maybe they were used for part of the old silver mines. Others believe the corridors were actually um, used for military uh, purposes. But it says the multiple level catacombs are cut into very hard rock. The first level corridors were built during the 14th century. The second and third level corridors were also added in the 16th century. And finally, during the 17th century, some of the corridors are reinforced with brick foundations. In the middle of each corridor, there are several shallow gutters to drain the water collected from the walls that trickle down from the surface. Shafts going up the surface provide air ventilation for the corridors. Many of the corridors have access to underground water wells, and the temperature in these catacombs range anywhere between 46 to 53 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So I guess par for the course of what you would assume for a cave. But uh, in addition to the main man height corridors, there are also many networks of smaller tunnels forming the town's sewage system. Many centuries had passed since they had been constructed, and the catacombs had been abandoned and converted into sewage tunnels, which, after much flooding, caused a bunch of debris and trash to come down. Floods ensued, and the drainage systems were damaged. Now, if you fast forward to right around the 60s, most of the corridors had been then reinforced with concrete, and they had actually began trying to... um, refurbish these catacombs and open them to the public. They became actually open officially legally to the public to explore in 1991, but that's not before some really, really weird stuff happened. So, um, in 1978, there was a group of amateur speologists or what we might call spelunkers that were, um, basically exploring Mm -hmm. and they found something they called the shining corridor. There's a long corridor in these catacombs in the Czech Republic, where the walls were covered in a milky coating, which emits a greenish glow after being exposed to light. So basically, you'd shine your light, kind of like glow-in-the-dark paint. And then as soon as you turn the flashlight off, they would continue to uh, to glow. The vaulted corridor lies about 36 feet under the street level. The corridor is about 7 feet wide, 9.5 feet uh, tall. (laughs) For quite some time, many people didn't have any idea what would cause uh, this room to glow. According to one of the rumors, the fluorescence is due to the phosphorus being leaked from the bo- being leaked from the bones of all the monks that have been buried in the catacomb corridors above. So I don't know. What do you think? Glowing monk bone juice? Yeah. <laughs> Preston, could it be glow bug juice? Glow bug juice in her bone, Sean. That's what it is. I mean, it all comes together. It does. Man, look at that. <laughs> Mind blown. (laughs) Um, Other rumors just say basically this is a uh, organic substance. This naturally just uh, occurs with some amount of radiation. Um, But to be a buzzkill, of course, Prague sends some experts from their mineralogy department in the Faculty of Natural Sciences from Charles University. And they have discovered through taking a couple samples that this is actually a man-made substance with a very long afterglow interval rate. The substance contains zinc sulfide and barium, which sounds really boring to almost all the listeners. Um, and had been used for the mortar, which had been mixed into the walls. So what they're thinking maybe is it was like a backup uh, backup plan in case your your t- your torches or your uh, flashlights went out. It would cause the room to glow for a short period, hopefully uh, allowing you to escape safely. 
Um, they also think that it could be fungi or microbial activity. But that's not the only weird thing in there. When these uh, experts from Prague were down exploring, they had also heard or, uh, organ music going on. So they're down there, what did I say, like 36 feet under the street, and they can all of a sudden hear really creepy, eerie organ music playing. And try as they might, while they investigated, they could never figure out exactly what it was. Um, even in 1977, the ITAR TASS, which basically is a uh, Russian news agency, yeah, that is went down there to investigate, and they couldn't figure it out either. They couldn't figure out how any music would travel down the vast corridors. They couldn't find any hidden organs or um, pianos or anything like that. So, thank you, Bruce. They really haven't been able to explain why, in these creepy catacombs, you would be hearing organ music. So, yeah, but that's all cool, I guess, if you like rocks and, and stone you know, structures and stuff. But what I really like is the really creepy shit. And I think that's why we're here. So let's move over from the Czech Republic into Russia. In Russia, there are a series, uh, there are a group of people known as the Dajiri. So uh, the Dajiri are basically a underground, again, pun intended, group of guys and gals who do a lot of exploring. Um, I guess you'd say, again, kind of like some spelunkers. So one of the things they were doing while exploring the tunnels was exploring the tunnels underneath the Moscow Zoo. And while they were underneath the city zoo, they discovered giant rats measuring. That can't be right. I wrote 25 feet long. <laughs> New York has some pretty <laughs> giant fucking rats, man. So in Russia. <laughs> I don't think they're 25 feet long. <laughs> and that's the last we heard from Michaela Venus Dejiri. Um, two and a half feet long. They discovered giant rats under the Moscow City Zoo that measured over two feet long. It said that they approached the rats, and the rats began to act very vicious and kind of feisty. And uh, the only way they were able to save their lives was by tossing metal rods at these monster rats and fleeing the scene. <laughs> I'm kind of picturing like a Scooby-Doo movie. Back off the rats. The explorers had been descending into the subterranean world for 19 years prior to the time that they ran into the rats, and they had never encountered anything similar. The mutants, as Michaela described the rats, were two and a half feet long, or 65 centimeters, not counting their tails. One was probably a female, for its proportions were much smaller and the color was lighter. The Dajiri immediately alerted the city government notifying television media and reporters and the local police stations as well. The authorities closed the tunnels four days later. The rats were observed in the tunnels leading out of the zoo, at the American embassy, and even in the Russian White House, their parliament. So yeah, several days later after the, uh, several days later after they found the rats, they were also, uh, contacted by some, um, anonymous Soviet military officers saying that while they were in the underground military bunkers, they saw giant rats as well. And the only other thing they really talk about being as far as uh, underground oddities are an area they call other entities. Mikhailov also describes the subterranean life forms that he and his colleagues have encountered through the years. There are what they call bags, crawlers, and something called the glyuki and other ghostly phantom-like formations. So they talk about how in this underground area, of course, it's going to be dark and kind of musky and hard to see. And all they have is flashlights. They notice these star-like formations, kind of like urchins or uh, three-dimensional starfish that would just float out of nowhere in complete darkness. They would just appear and start floating towards these people. Once they got close enough, they would get brighter and admit sort of like these energy-filled tentacles reaching out, trying to grab the people. And they said that this kind of caused them to have this weird um, underground adrenaline rushes as these things started getting closer. They said sometimes under even deeper depths in the city that a jury would see illuminations from flashlights at the other end of the tunnels. As soon as they would get close enough to where they're almost going to meet in the middle of these other people coming towards them, the lights would go out and there'd be nobody there leaving nothing but silence. In some of the old abandoned tunnels, the Dajiri found strange, mysterious signs and symbols drawn on the walls, but couldn't explain who drew them. So not really like, um, you know, tagging and graffiti, just really weird symbols being carved into the walls. Mm -hmm. As they wander the tunnels in some places under old cemeteries, the Dajiri are able to observe ephemeral ghost-like creatures that extend their arms out towards the explorers, and as they're almost able to grab the Dajiri, they will trip and fall and sink into the water. So that's kind of weird, I guess, like little ghost zombies that's just creepy. wandering around. 
Hey, do, Rob, like, do we have any, like, uh, <clears throat> like caves that we can go exploring in Kentucky? Like, maybe we should, like, while we're up there visiting you, we should just go, like, exploring in caves. And we'll bring guns and stuff in case we come across Bigfoot and, like, weird ghost zombies there, and giant rats. There are rats. tons of caves under, uh, under Kentucky. However, I'm not going cave diving, spelunking. What's the fucking do? Come on, what's the worst that could happen? I, Bigfoot's dick? I could get stuck in a hole and die. <laughs> We'll be there, Rob. We will help you out of that hole. I don't think you understand how caves work. <laughs> well, let's figure it out, Rob. <laughs> how about you figure it out and get back to um, it? See how that, all that goes. We could go, we could go exploring caves if they were like you know guided tours. Yeah, there's tours. guided tours caves, sure. Oh, those are I'm bull- going to second what Rob says. I'm not about to go in an unsanctioned cave with Preston while he's gun toting. <laughs> What's the worst that could happen? And I just think of everything Preston's ever involved in. <laughs> that was mean. <laughs> uh, but you've been there for all um, that. Something else that they talk about here um, is a creature they call the Kokriki, which are tiny creatures that appear on the photographs that they take after film has been underground and then developed. He doesn't know what these creatures are or what causes the optical illusion, but he says little creatures show up in the pictures they did not see when taking the photographs. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. One thing they also talk about in this underground tunnel system in Russia is the Nikolo Virsky near the Russian city of Ryzan or Ryazan. The communists closed it and built a young pioneer summer camp on the site of the monastery. According to local legend, the abbess cursed the camp along with a few other nuns, and they physically walled themselves off behind the walls of the abbess's house in the 1920s. Strange phenomena have been observed in the area of the camp ever since. Before storms, you can hear the sounds of bells coming up from underground, and singing by the walled-off women has been reported as well. After the ghost of the white nun appears. After that, the ghost of the white nun appears. It is about two or three meters tall and walks from the site of the old church to the abbess's house. The sighting is not frequent. The white nun is sighted only at night, but many people have seen her. When Mikhailov's Dejiri arrived on the site during the, their stay, they say they saw the ghost three times. Usually, they do not investigate mystical reports and legends, but in this case, they decided to proceed. They discovered an underground passageway that led to the abbess's house, which was underground by then. The passageway was located under the alley where the white nun had been sight, been sighted. But getting inside the burial was not easy. The burial area was not easy. Flashlights went out, the video camera stopped working, and bricks from inside the burial site flew straight at the Dajiri. The first of the group who entered the site fainted for several minutes and had to be dragged out by his colleagues. Mikhailov's people called themselves diggers of the underground planet. It is worth mentioning here that they also discovered Ivan the Terrible's lost torture chamber, catacombs, and passageways, a pond that was allegedly the site of a mass suicide, and a strange site under the Sigoverskaya Square in Moscow. There are so many abandoned industrial areas in Moscow for them to explore, so many secret tunnels and mysterious offshoots for the enigmatic Moscow subway systems to be mapped, and I'm blah blah cutting that part out because that's just the author. So, yeah. So in Eurasia, you've got creepy little starfish floating around and ghost zombies who keep tripping and falling in water before they can grab you. Twenty-five and a half foot long rats and the ghost of a nun. I thought that also I heard uh, there was a, a book that talked about uh, in one of the lakes in Russia that they were diving in, and uh, as they were swimming down, diving in the water, um, they started to see this glow. And then the divers came across like these eight foot long humanoid glowing white beings that were supposed to be like Atlanteans or some lost civilization or other. Hmm. We're going to have to look that up because, you know, that's actually sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, Yeah, it does. It really does. No, okay, so I was going to read this in the news articles earlier, but then I realized this is from back in 2008, but it's relevant. From the telegraph.co.uk, Russian gravedigger dresses up 29 bodies and then puts them on display at his home. A Russian historian dug up 29 bodies before taking them back to his apartment, where he dressed them in women's clothing and put them on display. Anatoly Moskiv, 
had always been open about his interest in the dead and eagerly described how he had loved to rummage through old cemeteries, studying gravestones and uncovering the life stories behind them. What he failed to mention, according to the police, was that he had also dug up dozens of bodies and taken them back to his apartment, where he dressed them in women's clothing, scavenged from other graves, and then put them on display like dolls. A police video of the man's apartment in Volga River City near a town I'm not going to even try to pronounce, released Monday, shows his macabre collection of what looks like dolls. Life-size, they are dressed in bright dresses and headscarves, their hands and faces wrapped in what appears to be cloth. Police say they were mummified. Instructions for doll making. Were, oh God. Police say the bodies were mummified. Instructions for doll making were found in the apartment, police say, and the video shows old-fashioned plastic dolls in frilly dresses lying around the house scattered around. Police refused to name the suspect arrested last week, but released photographs of him gave his age as 45 and described him as a well-known specialist in the history of the city about 400 kilometers, 25, no, 250 miles east of Moscow. The 45-year-old historian has been considered to be the ultimate expert in cemeteries. Russian news reports quoted police saying that the old man had only selected the remains of young women for his grisly collection. Ugh. Ugh. The arrest had been followed from a long-running investigation into the desecration of graves at several cemeteries in the city, beginning in 2010. Police... That doesn't make sense. This fucking article's from 2008. Oh, nope. It's from 2011. There's egg on my face. So, yeah. Um, What do you think about that? Some people are crazy. Some people are crazy. It says here that he is pretty good at surviving on his own in the wild. He drinks from puddles. He spends nights in haystacks or abandoned farmhouses. And once he even slept in a coffin, ready for a funeral. He's also been repe repeatedly questioned by police who always let him go. Just last month, he wrote a piece for a publication on necrology to explain his interest in the dead. He said that when he was 12, he came across a funeral procession whose participants forced him to kiss the face of a dead 11-year-old girl. As an adult, pushed my face down to the waxy forehead of the girl in an embroidered cap, and there was nothing I could do but kiss her as he ordered. Creepy. So, um, Preston, you put together this really cool recording. And I'm going to go ahead and play that for us in a segment that Preston is dying to uh, interject into our show. No. <laughs> <laughs> From the glowing crystal ball of a mad gypsy psychic comes Preston's Tales of Predictions. Muslim and Arabic 
radical Zionism must mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, other nations, once more divided on this issue, will be constrained to fight to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual, and economical exhaustion. The Illuminati would work their bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens would be obliged to defend themselves against the world's minority of revolutionaries, which will exterminate the destroyers of civilization and the multitude of dissolution with Christianity. So much of this parallels our world right now in its current state, from 9-11 to its war with terrorism and ISIS. How much did Pike really know? Did this letter in fact even exist? Shrouded in mysteries are the predictions of three world wars. Rob, what do you think about Albert Pike's three world wars? That is the dumbest story I've ever listened to. Twice now. Twice. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so we should let listeners know that we tried to do this story last time, and it was just so much information that it was like worse than hearing Sean read about like measurements in caves that we were. Li- I literally, I was putting everybody to sleep, and like I think Rob really wanted to hang himself uh, while he listened to that story. So we thought we'd put it in a different format to make it a little bit more, you know, easy going on the on the ears there. And no, it was uh, way better than the hearing it that that way than the first. I uh, I I think that uh, I I mean that there's there even though people might say okay well there's no proof that the letter ever existed I would point out that what's interesting is they were discussing the letter even before World War One happened so there were still some talks of this information about Nazism and other things being out there before these events actually took place. So it's still kind of kind of interesting to me, at least. What do you know, Rob? Yeah, what, what do, do you, you know? know? You try being a thirty second, thirty third, tenth degree. Well, folks, I think there's something to the predictions. Rob thinks the predictions suck, and Sean's just no. Well, nobody knows where Sean's at. I think on that it's hard to go off of a man's three predictions. If you're going to write and document three times he made predictions, that's really fantastic. He's three for three. But we don't realize that this guy could have a journal full of, like, 400 really shitty predictions, too. Like, I predict by the year 2004, all cats will have wings and poop out of their mouths. Whoa. We don't get that. We don't We don't have that. I, I, I've seen my cat actually throw up a hairball, and sometimes it does smell like they shit out of their mouth. Ewey. That's I'm just nasty. saying. I predict by the year 1940, we'll have flying carriages. With horses. So, I mean, yeah, the guy predicted two world wars out of three. That's not bad. And, I mean, we can't say he was wrong because maybe the third one hasn't happened yet. I mean, some some would speculate that the, the third is already happening. Like, we're in the midst of the beginnings of the third world war, so to speak. Yeah, but some people speculate that dogs can't look up. Well, what do they know? <laughs> they can't look up what, like? Stock they can't look like up in the sky. Can't look up in the sky. Some might speculate it's because they have bad backs. Hmm. Hmm. There we go. There you go. Well, guys, uh, <laughs> thanks for sitting through this one. <laughs> Not too shabby. Not too shabby at all. So, uh, with that, I say let's let's cut this right here and go ahead and plug some stuff. Preston, what do you want to plug? Uh, check out uh, Big Steven's uh, podcast, O oh, Indeed. And uh, I took the time to listen to my first uh, pixelated sausage thing from Mark uh, that he did uh, like a week ago. Check out those two podcasts. They're really great. Um, and that's really all I got for plugs. Sweet. Rob? Uh, well, Pixelated Radio, Corey, Rich, Mark, and I. Do a podcast about video games. Um, and also, we play D&D occasionally on Wednesday nights when everybody's <laughs> available. Um, so, yeah. That's Sweet. about it. There you go. Um, TV shows, as always, check out more Black Mirror. And if you're a fan of not 
knowing what the hell's going on in a TV show, but loving every second of it, check out Dirk Gently. It might be one of my favorite new TV shows. Yeah. It's. Look, when I Dirk, it's not very gentle. <laughs> don't you gentle. Don't you Dirk into that dark night. <laughs> don't you go out into that dark night. Yeah, it's a pretty fantastic show. Um, it is a Douglas Adams. Uh, story. So it's, it's not word for word, but it's based loosely off of some Douglas Adams, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy kind of stuff. And it's truly fantastic. It's got uh, Elijah Wood in it and his co-host, whose name I just forgot, a delightful young British man. And it's just, uh, a bunch of shenanigans and tomfoolery. Cool. There we go. Well, we're going to cut and print and catch you guys next time. The cast that Pixelated Paranormal would like to thank you for listening to this week's episode. Pixelated Paranormal is here to tell you tales of the fantastical, the strange, the unknown. Tales that will move you a little further down the paranormal highway. If you'd like to share your own listener story, we would love to hear it. You have two ways. One, email us at pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. Again, that's pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com If you'd like to leave us a voicemail we have that set up too Dial us at 707-523-4263 Again, that's 707-523-4263 We'd really love to hear from you Again, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Pixelated Paranormal Your guide to the unusual and The Strange Out of something that's not interesting, Sean's going to continue to talk for 45 more minutes. <laughs> he has the voice of a Polish angel. We're going to make him do something in a diaper. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> Butt cheeks. <laughs>